Malcolm's already made some quite beautiful remarks about relationships and about the history. And on a much smaller scale, I just want to take the opportunity that I have now to encourage you guys. I was here about two years ago, um, and not long after COVID, things were a bit, yeah, 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 like a couple of years ago, um, and came and visited with a family member brought me. And it was quite dour, people's moods were quite low, it was just after COVID. There was that, I don't know what's happened to it, that was that old, yeah. uh, that wooden yeah, piano. Yeah, yeah. Was it slightly out of tune? It sounded yeah. Yeah. Was that just your playing, Malcolm? I don't know. Yeah, no, it's not like, yeah, no, no. Um, no, Malcolm's great <laughs> pianist. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I just want to say that the, the difference between then and now for the congregation and for the atmosphere is night and day. Um, it's really quite impactful to see how God has worked through you guys. And yeah, it's just really encouraging to be here and to see you all and to see how, the, how you guys have, have very clearly grown. So um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about the theme is going to be compassion, Jesus' compassion for us, um, what that says about him, uh, who he is. Um, and it's also going to be about our need for him, our dependency on him. Um, I want to very quickly read uh, a verse, Romans 8, 1. Um, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation, none, for those who are in Christ Jesus. So completely free. Okay, so today I'm, I'm going to aim to impart two things. The first is, for those of you who don't know Christ, um, I want to help you to know him a little bit, if I can. For those of you who do know Christ, I want to remind you of or help you to know some new things about his nature. Um, and to that end, we're going to be looking at Matthew 26, verses 36 through 46. I'll begin with a word of prayer, then. Father... I pray that you can help me to not see myself in this, Father, not to become self-absorbed or to think about what I'm doing or what I'm saying, but just to give, Father, the best that I can with what I, I believe I've received from you, Father, that I can help and, and love. And uh, I pray that we'll all be impacted by your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so the plan is I'm just going to go through a couple verses at a time, and I'm going to try and offer some exposition to you about what I think those verses are, are saying. Okay, so, let's see the upside down. Um, do you know what? We're just going to have it upside down, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Okay, so, at least this is the thing that's gone wrong, we can get it out of the way. <laughs> Something slight, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, <clears throat> 36 to 38. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. So up front, I want to deal with a couple of definitions in verses 37 and 38. Um, The Greek word used for sorrowful in the original text is perilupos, and it's a compound word. So it is a, a word that is peri, which means around, and like or leap, which means grief or sorrow. Okay, so... Where we read sorrowful is something more like it, it conveys a sense of being consumed, overtaken, overwhelmed, engulfed with and by grief and sorrow. It is a really, sorrowful doesn't quite capture the, the, the profundity of his experience. Next is the word for distressed, which is adamonio. Uh, it's derived from the word adamon and it describes a great mental anxiety, really. Um, I think the best way to understand it, or the best way that I've been able to understand it, is it's something like a panic, a panic attack almost. Um, and I think that that's something that struck me, you know, it's, it's quite something to know that the Son of God, Son of God, <laughs> who had within the fullness of the deity, had an experience like panic. You know? um, and for those of us who have experienced a panic attack, you'll know that it's not a trivial event. Um, uh, it, it can range from uh, an anxious sort of background hum to, to something that can be described only as a, as a mania or a madness. And um, I find it quite moving to know that that's an experience that Christ had probably to an extent that we can't even fathom. And then finally, the word for soul, this is one that many of us will be familiar with, uh, psyche. Um, This is the same word used in various parts of the New Testament to refer refer to the soul. Um, And it means the inner life of a person. It's uh, 
is something that can mean self, life, the, the essential quality within you, um, the thing that is you, you know? So for Jesus to say that his soul is grieved to the point of death, is to say that he had no experience. Again, no experience with sadness and terror. It was, it was only sorrow, you know? It's, it's all consuming and, and he could hardly tolerate to live at all. Um, and so for me, it made me wonder, well, what does it say about him that in spite of that experience, he was willing to suffer and die voluntarily um, despite his sorrow, you know? And, and I started wondering, well, what could motivate him to do that? What, what was the driving force that caused him to overcome? And um, it's a motivation that goes far beyond mere obedience to the Father. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a type of righteousness that's born only of, of love of a true love, you know? And that's sort of what we're gonna be exploring a little bit as we go through is, is the love of Jesus and the compassion of Jesus. So uh, I'll read 39, but we'll skip over it and come back to it when we get to 42, and there's a very particular reason for that. Um, so verse 39, and going on a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 40 to 41, and he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Excuse me, I'm just gonna get some water. <clears throat> so in this verse, um, the well, 40 to 41, we've got highlighted the difference between Jesus and fallen mankind. Um, we have his disciples who are standings for us, for all of us in this scenario. And what it tells us is that Christ is capable and we're not. While he was praying and wrestling with his flesh, his disciples were asleep. Um, Christ is righteous, we are not. We need saving, he saves. He gives of himself to us. And so completely do we receive the Lord that even though we're helpless before his work, we go on to be truly able. Inheriting the divine nature, which is the capacity to grow in love, becoming more and more able to love as Christ loves by our faith in him. Second Corinthians 5, 17 reads, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Peter is an example of this regenerative power in the Holy Spirit. Let's consider Peter for a moment. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he's incapable of staying awake, of resisting temptation, of resisting his flesh. When Jesus is arrested, he denies that he even knows Jesus three times because he's scared about what's going to happen to him if he affiliates himself with Christ. Peter was wicked. And um, we, like Peter, were fallen. Those of us in Christ, we were fallen. But after his work on the cross, Peter became one of the foremost leaders of the church. Christ remade Peter. He remade him into a new creation. Where before Peter was a treacherous coward, then he became a brave and faithful servant. So brave and faithful, in fact, that he was eventually martyred, or at least the tradition tells us he was martyred for his faith. And in a way that is quite staggeringly brutal, he was crucified upside down. And he took that death where he denied Jesus before. He took that death you know, without denying Jesus this time. Um, and I think this is something I want to pause on for a moment, is that, that concept of regeneration that, that Peter had um, through the Holy Spirit. It's the same regeneration that we're experiencing every day in Christ. You know, we are, through the Holy Spirit, we are receiving the same inheritance as Peter, you know, the same... Peter says it himself in uh, Second Peter, we are partakers of the divine nature, you know. We get to grow in love, grow in that Christ-likeness, you know. I don't, by the way, I, I don't mean to suggest that we are gonna develop the same gifts of the spirit that Peter had, that's not what I'm saying. What I mean is the way that Peter's character was changed, you know, the fruit of the spirit, love, kindness, patience, self-control, those fruit, that's what we're bearing, and that's what, that's what Christ, that's what our faith bears through us. You know, we, um, I really want to impress that upon us that we're not just washed clean in Christ. We are, his blood makes us spotless, but we are, he, he gives us his righteousness. He, 
He takes our unrighteousness and exchanges it for his own righteousness. He takes our own fallen nature and gives us a new nature, you know, a nature of strength in the spirit that allows us to contend with our, our weak flesh and to repent of our sin. You know, and I think that it's worth rejoicing over our salvation and, and never forgetting that apart from Christ, apart from the grace and love that are in him, we are low, perhaps even lower, perhaps even lower than, uh, than the disciples in the garden. You know? We really are compromised without Christ. But in him, we are made good for righteousness. So we'll move on. Verses 42 to 43. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, let your will be done. And again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So this is where we're going to refer back to verse 39. Um, I am not the most eloquent guy in the world, so this is going to be hard for me to explain, but I'm going to do my best, okay? Um, <laughs> So in verse 39 and in verse 42, we have basically the same wording. It is, um, in, in verse 42, it's, I drink it, unless I drink it, uh, no, sorry, my father, if this cannot pass, unless I drink it, let your will be done. And in verse 39, it reads, uh, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Okay, that's what we have in the English. However, in the Greek, there are different words in verse 39 for will and verse 42 for will. So in verse 39, the word for will is thalema. And in verse 42, it's balema. Okay, they have basically the same meaning, but there's a difference of emphasis between them. One is more impactful than the other. One is deeper than the other. So a more literal translation of verse 39 would have it read something along the lines of, my father, if it be possible, let this come pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I want, but as you want. Whereas in verse 42, it would still remain will. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, let your will be done. Okay? So with this literal rendering, there is a, a notably different emphasis between the two verses. Initially, Jesus is able to submit to the desires of the father, but implied by the lesser degree of emphasis in Thelema, wants his will is not yet aligned to the will of the father, not wholly. Specifically, Jesus seems unwilling to drink the cup himself. He desires that someone else would drink it, that the cup would pass to someone else. The growth in emphasis between want and will in verse, from verse 39 to verse 42 means that a development has occurred in Jesus' attitude between those two verses. And so then the question for me was, well, what inspired that change in his attitude? What happened to cause Jesus to go, well, if you want me to do this, I'll do it. To, if you will for this to happen, I am wholly on board. Um, so obviously prayer. Prayer is a powerful, powerful and effective tool. It is the number one weapon in a Christian's arsenal. Yes. And I don't want to overlook that, but I, I, that's not my focus today. My focus is, okay, so there seems to be this, this interplay that happens between the Father and the Son, okay, in, in the prayer. So um, <clears throat> Jesus prays to the Father, if this cup, you know, if there's no one else to drink this cup, I'll drink it. And then he goes to the disciples. Who are the disciples? Well, they're the people who, have been with Jesus in his ministry. Um, they're the only people who, in theory, could have drunk the cup apart from Jesus or with him, you know? And he finds them asleep. And he wakes them up and he goes back and he prays, God, if there's no one else, this time he's more submitted. But if he goes, God, if there's no one else, I'll do this. And he goes back and he finds them asleep again. And this time he doesn't even wake them, he just goes back and he prays. You know? And, um, and it got me thinking, well, what's actually happening in Jesus' heart there, you know? It's, it, he observes the inability of the disciples to either help he or themselves. And he accepts that it's the Father's will for him to drink this cup alone. Because he sees his disciples' weakness and he understands there is no one else who can go to the cross. There is no other hope. None strong enough nor righteous enough except him. He therefore accepts the cup, his fate. Our obedient love to the Father, yes, but also... And this is the point that I really want to get across. He accepts the cross out of compassion for his disciples who could not carry their own crosses, who could not resist the flesh, who had no hope to resist the adversary apart from Jesus Christ himself saving them. So uh, put yourself in Christ's position for a moment. We've kind of gone through this already, but you pray to the Father, the cup pass from you, you find the disciples asleep a couple of times. That happens. If I were in Jesus' position, how would I respond to that point? <laughs> would I have still gone to the cross to them? I don't know. Probably not. 
Um, I probably would have got angry, resentful. I, I probably wouldn't have wanted to suffer and die for them. Um, I probably would have argued with the father that I was too precious to die for these sinners. <laughs> um, but that's not what Christ does. It's not what Christ does. Um, instead, he sees the disciples, the disciples and their helplessness against sin, and he's moved to compassion for them, to pity almost for them. We had no other hope. We had no other hope. And it was at that point that Jesus, seeing the weakness in the flesh of the disciples, his will becomes perfectly aligned to the Father. Okay. And this actually says something about Christ's nature and about his relationship with the Father and about his, his, his status as deity. You know, his nature is the same as that of the Father. So when the Father sees us weak in the flesh, it inspires compassion in him. It causes him to move to try and save us. In the same way, Christ sees our weakness and is inspired to compassion, which moves us and moves him sorry, to try and save us. It's the same nature, encountering the same fallen spirit and responding in the same way. Um, you know, and this was the compassion that was sufficient to motivate Jesus to go to the cross on our behalf. 44 to 45. So leaving them again, <clears throat> he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. So I'm going to very briefly, not change the focus, but touch on a, a related issue, um, which is the messianic quality of Christ. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus reveals himself as Messiah in two distinct ways. The first is that he gives himself the title of the Son of Man, um, who is the Messiah prophesied in Daniel 7, 13 to 14, which reads, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So he identifies himself as Messiah by calling himself the Son of Man, which is a messianic title. But, and I kind of touched on this already, he, he reveals himself as the Messiah through his nature, um, the divine nature, which is submission to the Lord and love of his own enemy. The Christ is not only known by his titles, nor his miracles, but also and ultimately by his uniquely loving nature. This love was fully revealed and expressed on the cross, which was the perfect fulfillment of the law of God. You know, um, the law is summarized by Jesus in Matthew 22. And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. On the cross, we have that lived out practically. He loves God by going to the cross, he loves the Father, but he also loves his neighbor, loves his enemy. Jesus showed himself to be God in, in that way. You know, he, he demonstrated that because he has that same loving nature that only belongs to God. <coughs> that he was Messiah, the one who was going to save us. So, and then finally, it just begins with a transition here. Rise, let us be going in verse 46. See my betrayer as a hand. And this is where the crucifixion and the trials physically begin. And it's the central event in the entire narrative of creation is the cross. It commences at this point during which the fullness of Christ was known as a revelation of the Old Testament scriptures that the deity would be revealed through the cross, both his grace and his judgment against sin. Jesus is the fullness of our God. This is the most crucial aspect of his identity, his deity. Jesus is God. Okay, so let's briefly run back on qualities we've identified in Jesus throughout these passages so far. He is the one who is obedient to the Father over his own flesh. He is different to us in our fallen nature who is sinful. He is the one who loves his enemies more than he loves himself. He is the one who perfectly images the loving nature of the Father, having the fullness of the deity within himself. 
He is God in character, authority, and nature, but he is also a man who wrestled and struggled against the flesh. He is therefore the reconciliation between God and us, truly representing the fullness of both. As early Christians have coined a phrase and as the tradition has continued on, Jesus is truly God and truly man. Suffering as we suffer, dying as we die, but never sinning as we sin. Instead of overcoming the flesh by the Holy Spirit of God, this man, this God, gave himself up as a ransom for us, for you. So, exposited the passage now, I want to briefly share from my own life. Um, I used to really struggle with a works mindset. I used to have thoughts as irrational as. <laughs> Um, and I really hope some of you relate to me because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sound crazy when I say this. If I don't study the Bible today, or if I don't share my faith today, will that have some bearing on my salvation? You know? It, will my salvation be jeopardized my, by my failure to perform works today? Then recently I found myself among family members whom I'd not seen for a long time. And uh, through my interactions with them, it became apparent how starkly different my character is now than it used to be. Um, my family told me they saw a difference in me. And, and even if they hadn't, I had still noticed it myself because of the way that I've been interacting with them differently and the way that I've been feeling towards them differently. And uh, since this encounter with my family, I can say with full assurance that my nature has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. My repentance through the Spirit has, has borne fruit in my heart. And, um, and that fruit is a testimony to my salvation. If I wasn't in Christ, I wouldn't have changed in these ways, you know? Um, and because of my faith, God bore it through me. God bore these changes in my salvation. And, and then I started thinking about, well, where did that faith come from? What facilitated my, my belief that allowed the Holy Spirit to, to then work in me? And it came from becoming more and more intimately familiar with who Christ is through the study of scripture and through, through how I lived my life, you know, through the application. It was not just that I, I saw the scriptures and read and, and became familiar with the technical knowledge of who Christ is, but it was that I began to try and live on a foundation of love um, the way that he calls me to and to have communion with Christ through that shared love, through that shared lifestyle. Um, you know, I get to know him by walking, obviously in a far, to a far lesser degree, but it, it's some, some way in his footsteps, you know? Um, you know, our salvation, it, it made me realize that my salvation is not the consequence, truly isn't the consequence of my works. It's not, it's my faith. You know, I can build my faith through living day to day as a Christian and I, I can build my faith by studying the word, but it's my faith ultimately that saves me. You know, our salvation doesn't come from ourselves because we're incapable. Our salvation comes through Christ who lacks nothing. We are saved. You know, uh, I heard a once, once a, uh, a really good summary of the difference between works for salvation and faith for salvation. It was a, uh, some people say it's works plus faith equals salvation. But the person who was speaking said it was more like faith equals salvation plus works. You know how it goes, you know? Um, and the steadfastness of, of our faith and our character is a reflection of how great our confidence is in the truth of Christ. And confidence in the truth of Christ comes from pressing on by the guidance of the word of God into a life of endurance, faith, and love. As 1 Peter 1, 3 to 9 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, 
though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. So specifically, um, things I've heard said to me, things I've said to people, um, our salvation is not brought about by how many people we've evangelized to or disciples we've baptized. It is such works as these are good, of course. There is no wrong in them. But when they are done sincerely, they are the fruit of faith. That is to say, if we make such pursuits, it is because the Holy Spirit has been changing our natures so that we live in love because we have a sincere faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If a person is faulted in their faith, if they lack the fruit of the Spirit, it is often because their eyes are not on Christ. Indeed, the politics of the churches, the disunity, our sin, our pride, our enmities, the root of these things is not Christ, whose root bears only the fruit of the Spirit, which is the divine nature of love that brings eternal life. But the root of our sin is the flesh, which bears only death. On the other hand, we must also show grace, um, recognizing that the work of sanctification, the work of regeneration is ongoing, and that there is, so to speak, a difference between an immature heart, that is a heart that is less mature than it could be, and uh, a maturing heart, a heart that is young in Christ and can hardly be expected to be perfected yet. We repent as a decision in one moment, yes, but as a seed planted and watered must be given time to bloom, so too must we be gracious to those whose repentance is fresh, striking a balance between convicting and encouraging. Pursue your faith and maturity through knowledge and through practice. We know him in the word and in, his, in the application of his word. God desires your salvation. God desires a relationship with you. Do not reject his grace because you'll be measured by your acceptance or rejection of his grace. Your acceptance or rejection of the Lord as he was revealed in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. And indeed, for those who are in the faith, continue to trust in the Lord, whose faithfulness is our shield and strength. He has revealed the truth of his love for you upon the cross. Okay, so finally, I'll conclude with some re reiterations. Christ is savior, Christ is God, Christ is compassionate, Christ is gracious, Christ is the Messiah of all of us, Christ is the judge of all of us. He suffered in the flesh of man, but loves with the heart of God. He gives us the gift of eternal life freely and judges fairly, which is the condemnation of all who deny him. So finally, in preparation for the communion, I encourage you all to set aside everything but Christ. Think only of the Lord. Reflect on your Father in heaven and the work of salvation and the blessings he has given you. Consider everything you are not and everything he is and what you have inherited through him. An inheritance that for which we are sealed by the Holy Spirit who dwells within all who believe in Christ. I am now going to ask Sali to come up and pray for the prayer.